Good evening. I think maybe we should uh, start. We've been waiting for a few minutes because we're also expecting drums here. And as you can see, there are no drums still. So um, uh, maybe we'll have a few minute intermission at some point and bring the drums from outside when uh, Jonathan and his trio, they're here? Good. Jonathan and his trio will play later. Uh, before I start, I uh, want to uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Katharina Borsi, who's been really the person who's made this event possible. And uh, we've worked together very closely, but I think uh, without her, we certainly wouldn't have this event. And also Joel Newman, Belinda Flaherty, and all the speakers uh, who have come, many of them, and performers, many of them who've come from afar. I would like to thank them for their participation, and all of you, of course, for being here on such a wonderful afternoon when, if I was in your position, I'd probably be outside uh, sunbathing or something since the weather in London has been so awful for the last three months. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to try and uh, set the scene in a way um, uh, about our um, conference after the diagram, performative notations in uh, architecture, dance, film, and music. Um, I'm very much hoping that this will be one of a number of uh, conferences or symposia that we will have on topics related to aspects of uh, notation, performativity. Uh, maybe we'll have something next fall on the question of, of uh, sports and architecture and dealing more, more specifically with uh, questions of, of movement in relation to, uh, to, uh, to sports. Uh, tonight and tomorrow's uh, conference, um, the title um, after the diagram, I suppose Munson should have had a question mark after the, <laughs> after the diagram question mark, rather than uh, as a um, clear statement of fact of after the diagram, in the sense that uh, I think the title, in one sense, uh, literally anticipates what is to come after you are engaged in, in architecture, specifically uh, with, the, with the question of uh, diagram or the diagramming stage or moment of the architectural project. What is next? What happens when you're working, uh, projecting, in a sense, through the diagram? Um, and maybe uh, it also has a more um, critical um, aspect to it in terms of uh, what is to come after the diagram um, as a movement, a phenomenon uh, that I think in architectural terms has been um, very influential uh, in many respects, in many, um, specifically in many schools of architecture, but also many kinds of practices, in the sense of addressing the, the kind of problematics of, uh, of the question of, uh, of diagram. Uh, to um, recognize how one can actually uh, work with, uh, with diagrams in, in, in different ways, uh, um, in addition to the ones that we, we already have. The subtitle of the conference, Performative Notations in Architecture, Dance, and Music, uh, is, uh, is to put the emphasis more now on the performativity or the performative aspect of, uh, of notation, uh, in the sense that uh, the many um, diagrams, many notations, uh, are uh, clearly addressing um, uh, this, uh, this uh, performative uh, situation as the, as the main um, condition of the diagram uh, in the sense that uh, what they project also involves uh, very specific performative uh, conditions. But then I see that when we have uh, architecture, dance, film, and music, there is a sort of implicit suggestion that there is a kind of equivalence between these uh, disciplines, um, um, at least in terms of a kind of um, analogical or, or metaphorical um, uh, equivalence. And, I'm, and I think that's something that obviously will be discussed, and I'm not sure uh, that uh, that is the case. I think, the, the, if anything, it seems to me that uh, architecture is one of the, the disciplines where there is more of a connection between the notational and the visual uh, through conditions of similitude in terms of uh, um, occasionally transferring maybe too seamlessly uh, from, uh, from the notational to, uh, to the visual. Uh, whereas maybe in the other disciplines, um, 
there, is, uh, there are very particular conditions uh, in a way of uh, relating, uh, let's say, or constructing the relationship between notation and performance. Um, but it seems that there is, a, there is a history of correspondences between these various disciplines anyway. And in, in architecture, I'm sure we're all familiar with a very long history of, uh, let's say, the connection between architecture and music, which goes back many centuries, specifically uh, during the Renaissance period. And uh, I think the work that, for example, people like Wittkover did in architectural principles in the age of humanism are still to be, in a sense, worked through um, uh, in terms of uh, the whole issue of proportions or the problem of harmonic proportions in architecture, something that I think probably An Andrew will, uh, will touch on in, in some respect in his uh, presentation. But what is interesting in, uh, in Wittkover's work is that he says that the conviction that architecture is a science and that each part of a building inside as well as outside has to be integrated into one and the same system of mathematical ratios may be called the axiom of Renaissance architects. Architects weren't free during the period of Renaissance to apply their own system of ratios that ratios have to comply with conceptions of higher order. And in that sense, the question of proportions becomes obviously a key aspect of the whole construction of the architectural project. And since man is made in the image of God, the question of the proportions of architecture having to directly relate to the proportions of the human body would be one of the key aspects of the understanding of these ratios, of these proportionalities. But, uh, Specifically, uh, people like Alberti discuss the correspondence of musical intervals and architectural proportions and suggest that numbers by means of which sounds affect our ears with delight are the very same ones which please our eyes and our minds. Therefore, uh, there is a direct correlation between audible and visual uh, conditions of, uh, of uh, proportionality. Uh, what works for the ear also works for the eye in some way. So that's, that's the claim. The situation, however, in architecture, when we see, uh, especially in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years, when architects uh, address this question of the relationality between architecture and music or architecture and notation, it tends to become often too directly instrumental. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the, of the Tokyo Opera Project of, of uh, Bernard Chumi, where maybe the notational system the, the script itself, the notation itself became the mechanism for the production of the architecture. Somehow the, the, sh the shape of the, of the notation is the thing that forms the, uh, the architecture. But I think what uh, becomes interesting in the context of our uh, conference is not so much the, the concept of metaphorical associations and illusions between architecture and music or architecture and film. Again, in terms of film, you can think of many projects when uh, uh, people deal, uh, address this question of re uh, relationality immediately. It focuses on questions of fragmentation and architecture that like film in some way is fragmentary and fragmented in character. And so the analogies are very direct in terms of, uh, in terms of association. What um, I, I feel the conference is, is bringing together is a slightly different approach where there is the, the, the conception of, in a sense, parallel dis discourses, um, uh, parallel disciplines of, of uh, architecture, dance, film, um, and music, uh, in order for us to see how the various systems of, of, uh, of diagrams or, or, or notations really uh, uh, are developed in relation to those disciplines specifically, and whether there are any grounds um, for potential uh, cross-fertilization between uh, the various disciplines. Again, I'm, I'm, for those of uh, us from the A, I mean, for example, the work that's being done in, in DIP3 here, where many of the students have been working with, uh, with uh, video work, uh, seems that it brings out something of this understanding of the ephemeral character, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is worked through uh, video, which then is seen in relation to, uh, to the architectural project. Um, and uh, I think it's for this reason that we have brought uh, all the various speakers uh, uh, together uh, today and, and uh, tomorrow. 
when people uh, discuss diagrams uh, in, in, in relation to architecture, and we happen to have uh, some of the people who've made major contributions to this field, like uh, Bob Somal or Andrew Benjamin, I think mostly the discussion of diagrams uh, emphasizes at once, in a sense, the kind of role of diagrams as a projective device, as a device for uh, 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 a mechanism, in a sense, for projecting new forms of realities that were previously unforeseen, and at the same time as a mechanism of, of as a device for criticism, which is uh, seen uh, specifically uh, in, uh, often in relation to uh, a kind of critique of uh, aspects of representation and the architecture of meaning and uh, the whole uh, territory of, of a kind of uh, fetish of, uh, of construction of the, the kind of tectonic uh, arena. Uh, and by focusing on the, uh, the relationality, the operational dimension of uh, diagrams, uh, most of the authors, and I believe this, this to be the case, that diagrams then deal with the invisible, with the, with the oscillations between the virtual and the actual, uh, un, un, in, in, in a sense, rendering the invisible dimension visible through the act of, of the construction of the diagram itself. Um, the diagram then uh, constantly tries to negotiate this uh, territory between activity and form, between events and space. Um, and yet the question of how this mediation occurs between the virtual and the actual, how the mediation occurs between um, activity and form is something that um, I think there have been more, uh, in a sense, uh, successful uh, uh, procedures or examples, uh, uh, and, and sometimes I think it's been probably less successful. But there is the other side of the diagram which has been talked about in terms of um, not going from the diagram to architecture, but an architecture that itself also has cert certain behaviors that are diagrammatic in nature. And the work of people like uh, Katsuo Sejima or Rem Koolhaas and, and others are, are, are thought to be somehow operating in this, in this manner where it, doesn't, it might not necessarily go from diagram to, to building, but that, that the, the, the architectural condition itself is, is diagrammatic. Joel, could we have the second slide? Actually, can you go through the first slide? So, the second one, sorry. But uh, in a way, one of the kind of issues that, that I think that the, the diagram raises is that despite its uh, desire to be projective and to address territories that have been previously unforeseen, there is a, there is a tendency for the, for the diagrammatic, for the diagram, to also become representational, in a sense. And I think that, that might be one of the questions of the move from the, the virtual to the actual. In a sense, uh, I'd like to argue that, let's say, this, this uh, office building that was done by Peter Eisenman some years ago in Japan dealing at that time not with the condition of the diagram specifically, but with the idea of weak thought in architecture, ends up fairly directly representing the concept of weakness as uh, articulated in the writings of, uh, of Vatimo and others by producing an architecture which in, in, in one sense becomes the representation of this thought, um, um, uh, literally. And in one sense, maybe in, in terms of the relationship between uh, things and their projection, uh, I thought it might be useful if we listen to, uh, to some music to see what might be the potential correspondences in, in terms of another discipline. So um, uh, there are two, uh, two pieces of music. One of them, the first one is Four Minutes. It's a piece by, uh, by Radiohead. And uh, the second one is a, is a piece by Brad Maldow. It's uh, his version of uh, the Radiohead piece, and it's eight minutes. So it actually uh, extends the piece that starts first as, as one kind of length to, to something that becomes twice the length. Joel, maybe you can play that, please. Sleep. The 
Yeah. 
Thank you. <laughs> that was quite good, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, because I know that, that Jonathan and his friends will probably touch on this a lot more, but uh, I think it's, uh, no, I think it was important to have the four minutes and just go through the time of the four minutes versus the eight minutes of the, of the, of the second piece and the, the, the very specific kind of duration uh, of, the <clears throat> of the piece itself and what was done in that piece, for example, through um, uh, specifically how, how certain parts of the music uh, are repeated. But the, the very act of kind of repetition itself is, is quite different to the way that most architects speak of, of repetition, um, in the sense that it's, it's also that repetition that with it brings, uh, brings the variety, brings with it the, the difference. Also that in relation to the first piece, of course, constantly th throughout, you can recognize the first piece. But there is a way in which the music goes uh, very far from the first piece, and yet it still has a dimension of rec rec recognizability uh, to it. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, Brad Maldow and his trio are working within very specific limits, in a way, that's part of this idea of the, the music itself being recognized. And then within the trio, uh, how the, um, the bass uh, player uh, and the, 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 the drums are actually working off each other um, with, uh, with the piano. And I think that kind of collaboration of the three pieces also is a very interesting um, <clears throat> condition in terms of how the work itself is, uh, is produced. Um, and, and presumably it, has, it potentially has a lot of connections with certain um, kinds of architecture that also work in this notion uh, or in this way which is more uh, sensorial or, or haptic in a way. Uh, can I go to the... Um, and I think touching on the question of... Uh, of uh, diagrams or, or drawings that address the question of projection. I think in one sense the idea of, of, of anamorphosis or anamorphic projections partly ad address this, this notion of how something goes through a condition of, of uh, transformation where the very content of the piece itself uh, changes in terms of drawing. Um, and maybe a more recent example of the work of Paul Robrecht with these uh, um, skylights that were designed for a project in, in Belgium, the relationship between the drawings and the, and the actual fabrication of the skylights themselves in terms of deviations from, uh, from uh, the regularity of the skylights. Um, or in the work of uh, the Spanish architect Alejandro de la Sota, who um, was working during a period in, in, uh, in Spain where there were very limited in a sense, technological materials that were available, how to work with these materials, which is not an architecture of, of tectonics uh, in the sense of, of uh, uh, his interest being uh, on, the, uh, on the sort of uh, the tectonic quality of the building, but really m much more in terms of what, this, what, what a building like this, this is a school in Madrid, what it achieves. Unfortunately, I don't have the section of this, but it's, it's primarily a kind of sectional building where the roof is a, uh, is, a, is a basketball court that links up to one street and then goes through the main uh, <clears throat> sports hall and the street. And basically, how through this, this notion of the kind of uh, the, the, the pragmatics of, of the materials, he's really constructing something which is incredibly imaginative in terms of its possibilities. Or the work of uh, Alidio Dieste in Uruguay, uh, where again the relationship between the construction of the building and the kind of spatialities that it, that it produces is in one sense uh, what I understand to be in a sense the best version of the diagrammatic which is also projective where the understanding of the materials of what the brick is actually capable of as a structural element and its, uh, and its uh, constructive possibilities um, helps to already be part of the way in which uh, the space itself is structured. So it's a, it's a form of kind of structuring, uh, similarly with these uh, warehouse buildings that uh, Dieste did, uh, where 
uh, the, the actual uh, section and, uh, and uh, the way that uh, even though the bricks are in one sense heavy material, he ends up producing an architecture that's ex incredibly light. So in one sense, this pragmatism also brings with it a, a certain um, revelation of inconsistencies in some way, an architecture or, or a situation where uh, uh, you uh, uh, reveal with, you use the architecture to really address uh, these kind of uh, complexities which are not part of uh, a kind of clearly rational process, but there is a kind of chaotic dimension uh, in this work as well, or the way that he's working with the light in terms of the split in the, in the roof of, uh, of this other factory building that he did. So in some ways I think it, uh, there is a certain um, parallel uh, between the kind of thing that we heard from Brad Maldow maybe, and the way in which the conditions of construction are helping produce uh, specific uh, spatial situations, uh, which is also in this territory between engineering um, and architecture, and that might be something uh, that, is, uh, that is useful. So I'm sure that the, uh, the uh, conference will hopefully help us think through this, this uh, issue of the relationship between the virtual and actual. How can we question the projected dimensions of diagrams in order to further articulate the relationalities, the relationships between the virtual and the actual? And how can the understanding of the, the performative characteristics and possibilities of different disciplines help us with the specifics of, um, of, of, uh, of each discipline. And uh, I think to help us through with this, uh, with this task, the first two speakers are, are David Curtis and Al Rees. Um, David Curtis uh, was until recently the uh, Arts Council Film and Video Officer and is currently uh, an AHRB, whatever that is, uh, research fellow at Central St. Martins um, and uh, he's archiving and curating British avant-garde film and video. And uh, A.L. Rees was formerly head of uh, time-based media at Maidstone College and since 1996 has been research fellow in film at the Royal College of Art. Uh, please welcome David and Al Rees. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, how fortunate people who don't know what AHRB means. <laughs> Great to be in a place where it's a mystery. We, uh, it's a funding body. Um, what we're going to do in the next half hour is to show a series of slides and mostly very short extracts from films to try to um, illustrate something about the relation between the diagram and the film. Now, almost all our examples uh, are taken from the experimental cinema, from the, the avant-garde, the artist cinema, uh, and they cluster around the 70s when the diagram was, um, as you will see, uh, a, a major constituent in the production of uh, certain kinds of experimental film. And the diagrams we're going to, uh, and notations we're going to look at, uh, are broadly in two classes. There are those that uh, rigidly determine the shape of the film. So there's a kind of a, 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 a direct link between the film and its source in notation and graphics. And then there's a series of other approaches to the, the notation and diagram um, in which the filmmaker um, <coughs> gives him or herself a kind of looser framework of interpretation to work in. So sometimes uh, the shape of the film is determined, but the exact content isn't. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the diagram shapes the, uh, the, the content of the image, but the structure uh, is, is, um, is, is left to uh, other uh, looser kinds of procedure. Well, we'll kind of try to um, illustrate and nuance that rather crude distinction as we go through. Um, everything I think that was said in the introduction applies to the work that we're going to look at, though in our half hour we're not going to be able to extrapolate all those connections, we'll leave that to you. But there is a magic ratio number which we'll come across again and again, uh, and that's 24. 24 frames a second is, is cinema's um, uh, proportion uh, with its video um, e equivalent in scanning, and uh, we'll literally see that enacted on the screen, both statically and in motion. But um, behind all films, um, especially, of course, 
big budget feature films, there lie acres of diagrams and notations, not all of them drawn up by accountants, but the graphs and grids of the accountants actually rather match the graphs and grids of the filmmakers as they work out their scripts and angles. And uh, unfortunately, on this occasion, we're not going to be able to look at that world at all. But it does, of course, include um, Hitchcock, uh, who began life as a technical uh, artist and uh, graphic illustrator, and um, Fritz Lang, also with an architectural background, who always notated and graphed and made models. Um, to flip the thing the other way around, um, Bernard Chumi, of course, extrapolates from the films the models, the possible models of architectural space that they suggest, even though the films, of course, are constructed around a highly artificial space. But our link between the worlds of the feature film and the experimental or underground film are the source of example number one uh, from Martin Scorsese. Apologies for these rather dull slides, or at least they seem dull from here. How are they from the front now? Uh, this is Taxi Driver. And uh, these rather crude little drawings, which I think is Scorsese's own, are they are here? Um, do what storyboarding, which is what the technique is called, does for feature films. It, it lays out the uh, storyline, breaking it down into shots, the script already exists, the script is stripped in underneath, which gives one sense of the time. But obviously the other sense of the time that's introduced at this stage is the filmmaker anticipating the length of the shot, the movement of the shot. Maybe not much happens in the shot, but the camera travels a long distance, so all that is kind of marked down on these little squares. It's usually one frame per shot, but sometimes if the shot is very complicated, there will be two or three frames. I'm talking about a little image up there, it's a frame. Um, and little marks sometimes stray out of the box from one to the next, indicating a kind of direction move or whatever. Um, Hitchcock, as Al mentioned, was a great storyboarder. He, notoriously, he storyboarded his film so exactly that he was rather bored during the shooting process. He would actually leave it to the cameraman. He sometimes didn't bother to look. He just waited to see whether the daily rushes, the film that came out of the camera, met what he anticipated when he drew the little boxes. He actually also sometimes had um, a professional artist who would help him draw the boxes. And sometimes, unlike Scorsese, the characters would actually resemble the, the stars who had been chosen to play and so on. Um, moving from that to a, um, oops, thank you, a, oh, we've got in the wrong order, never mind. This is a uh, uh, repertory by Ian Breakwell, English artist, and this is a single shot film that runs for about seven or eight minutes, and Ian is working out in this storyboard by walking around a building, it's a theatre in Bristol, uh, he's walk walking around, taking photographs, mapping out the sequence of the huge travelling shot that this film is. It's a single travelling shot. And working out underneath the dialogue, at least the monologue, because that's what he does, uh, that would accompany the shots. And he can stretch the storyboard to give himself more space by putting in more pictures, which means the track will have to go slower, and so on. So that's one uh, very literal way in which artists have worked with storyboards. This one was supposed to precede that. This is Vista Sound, a piece by um, Mike Leggett, also from the mid-70s. Um, in this, this is actually a poster for the film that he produced because he was so pleased with his storyboard. But actually, his storyboard is the sort of storyboard that um, documentary makers make. This isn't a documentary film, but documentary makers who clearly set out um, quite often with only a subject in mind and uh, they have to go pursue the subject with their camera. They don't know when they're starting out exactly what they're going to have in terms of final shots. So they have to break down what they've shot 
um, into little images like this. Sometimes they draw it, but very often they log them descriptively, but he's actually done it with little film trims from the end of shots to remind him of what the separate shots are. And he's working out the time sequence, uh, some sense of voiceover, and so on in that. Um, paradoxically, this is, this is very much a technique associated with 16mm film. Uh, nowadays, it's very rare that people edit on 16mm film anymore. People edit on Avid, which is a computer system, and actually the computer gives you precisely this. And I suppose in a way this is a response to what um, uh, filmmakers look, looked for. The, the Avid system of editing gives you tiny little postage stamps, rows of them on your screen that you can click on and you summon that piece of film and you glue it onto the preceding bit and so on as you start building up your sequence of montage that way. But this was the old fashioned way of doing it. Uh, moving from that to something much looser, this is Bruce McLean, well known graphic artist who occasionally strays into film performance as well. Um, this is a curious piece he made, a feature-length film called Urban Turban. Uh, this he is one of something like 150 pages, about this size, they're big, that he storyboarded his film on. Um, it's, it's a collection of ideas, basically. Each, each sequence is a collection of ideas. Um, the film was actually shot, a lot of it, in a studio and some of it on, on location. But uh, this graphic representation is partly giving him color ideas, it's partly giving him montage ideas. Um, but he actually also ended up incorporating some of these graphics in his film. Both these actual storyboard shots appeared in the film and uh, big cutout representations of the kind of color collages that are in the background there appear as graphic interventions in the film. Uh, moving on to, um, oh, well actually here's, here's just another part of it. Uh, um, here <laughs> Sometimes artists' graphic notations become extraordinarily private and uh, impenetrable, it would seem, to outsiders. This is film print by Peter Giddell from 1974. Uh, it's one of a series of diagrams that he did which represent stages in the evolution of his, uh, his film process. Um, Peter films a lot um, in terms of re-photography from existing footage that he projects. He sometimes films off uh, very close details of uh, photographs. Um, he plays a lot with focus and things like that in his films. His films, it have to, has to be said, are fairly um, impenetrable to observers the first time around. Uh, and that seems to be reflected in, in the graphics that he uh, creates en route to them. But again, but moving back to something much more uh, conventional, this was a storyboard produced by Nicky Hamlin, another English filmmaker, for a little one minute film which we're going to show you in a second. Um, this was him anticipating what the nature of the film might be. Uh, this was in fact a kind of competition where he was submitting ideas so this storyboard came as a kind of competition entry. And interestingly enough as he... Oh, sorry, I've gone in the wrong direction. Let's go forward. Uh, we're missing one. We've somehow we've lost one. Yes, no, the yeah, sir. Oh, go back a few words. Yep. Uh, <laughs> there was one in between. <laughs> Where did you? You got it for a second, and where's it gone? Go forward. Go forward one more. Fine. That's it. Yes, we've got most sequence. This is his version made after he started working on the film. Um, it was a film made in the Late Show studio at the BBC. He was uh, offered a kind of position as an artist to go and make a little work in there. And having sat and watched what they did there, he turned his early storyboard into something in a sense much more literal. Um, 
working out how he would spend his 60 seconds. There are maybe what, six of these storyboards. It's, it's sort of one for every 10 seconds or so. Anyway, we should now move into the first film, which is all one minute long. So this is the one minute film, My New Shi'ai, shot from the storyboards that you've just seen, uh, 1992. <laughs> To make the connection even more uh, literal, I mean that, that's a kind of what you could call a late structural film. I mean it's uh, it's in the the tradition uh, from which Hamlin emerged in the uh, later 70s. Um, but the connection is even more literal than the relation between most films and their diagrams, because the every item that you've just seen was of course shot in the studio where the film was made. It's comprised entirely of late show elements as a kind of you know, highly formal uh, exercise. Uh, and all the sounds you hear are recorded in the space where the film was shot. So the code is very tight there. Now if we go back, I think, to, we go forward, okay. If we go forward, how do we do that? For one, yeah, one more. Lovely. Okay. Now, as you can, and uh, have we got two of these, David? I'm now completely out of order. I'm improvising. Is there another one to follow this? No. This, this one. Okay, fine. Um, well, uh, one thing I don't need to say about a lot of filmmakers is that uh, their, their uh, drawing skills are not going to win them prizes. I mean, Martin Scorsese's drawings are uh, certainly among the worst in the world, but they led to a film that you all know and can interpret from the shots that you, that you saw. They're, they're obviously not about drawing, about notating. And um, something I think very similar uh, is true for Maya Deren. Uh, now, Deren, I guess, is best known as the founder of the, essentially, of the American post-war avant-garde uh, in the United States, uh, especially with her best-known film, Meshes of the Afternoon. Um, but we're going to look at uh, a very slightly later film made in 1945 called A Study in Choreography for Camera, and choreography for camera is also a kind of suggestive term in talking about notation and film. And here, um, what Darren did was to um, uh, diagram every single um, shot that she was going to use. And the, the, what you're looking at here is the last, almost the last page of her notes. Um, now, I know they're almost impossible to interpret as they are, but clearly what's in mind here is direction, and that's indeed the substance of the film, which we're now going to see uh, complete um, uh, in, 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 uh, in its uh, video form. Uh, not a wonderful copy, but um, uh, at least it's readable. Uh, and it choreographs the movements of a dancer, the um, dancer Tally Beatty, who collaborated with her on this uh, film, uh, a veteran of, uh, uh, of black and uh, Caribbean dance and theater. And what happens is, as you'll see, uh, the film moves from nature to, by a cut, uh, an interior domestic space, then by another cut to a large public space, in fact the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and uh, um, back again to nature for a final impossible leap in space before the dancer finally settles. The, sp the domestic space is Darren's own um, uh, home in uh, New York. So, architectural themes throughout, and we'll roll it straight through.
Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the three minutes, uh, three and a half minutes of Darren's 1945 study in choreography for camera. Um, she notates, though not in the sheets that, the, the sheet that you're looking at here, uh, every detail, including the fact that when the dancer spins his head impossibly fast in front of the multi-headed statue, he is indeed spinning his head too fast. She's changing the camera speed in, project, in, in, in shooting. Okay, so it kind of shoots him faster and faster. When he makes his great leap, which takes him seven shots, um, uh, he's in fact filmed leaping downwards, jumping downwards, but the film is projected uh, when the print is made in reverse, so he appears to move up, and Darren takes him those seven steps into the, uh, the imaginary space of film, which is, of course, not the same as uh, the, the, uh, the lived space of, um, uh, of, of uh, time and motion at all. Okay, now, if we move on to our next slide, uh, which we do by pressing the forward button, um, uh, leaping from 1945 to 1998, Dryden Goodwin, um, who I, I know his work has been very well received for self-evident reasons among uh, artists and architects. Um, this is uh, a strip of, um, from um, uh, a, a long work involving, as you can see, shots of planes. Um, but what Dryden Goodwin actually does is not only to prepare um, notation in advance, but having made the film, he'll then construct, as it were here, uh, an imaginary film based on his memory of watching the film. And this is something that he started with Slade when he would uh, draw somebody um, and then uh, look at the drawing and try to draw his memory of the drawing and then the memory of the drawing of the drawing. You know, so you produce a series of kind of memory works increasingly remote from the original source and the same with some of his um, exhibited works of films, uh, you know, drawings based on, uh, on, on films. Okay, our next slide is forward. That's the memory work. Okay, so what you saw first <coughs> was the um, the strips in the uh, the film, and here is the, uh, uh, the the memorization of it by the filmmaker, producing an additional set of notations, as it were, after the event. Jane Rigby um, was working in multi-screen installation in the uh, 1970s, both in film and in video. Um, she's now actually quite a well-known uh, TV producer, having made one of those other leaps from one dimension of uh, film and TV to another. This is uh, a series of diagrams and notes on the uh, shooting and consequently the positioning of a film um, which was projected in the four corners of the viewing space, the installation space in which it was, um, uh, in, in which it was shown. Okay, so it was a film um, uh, landscape piece um, projected into the four corners of the um, exhibition area, wherever it could get a, a screening, and the movement of the audience in front of the beams of projectors would produce a, an additional imaginary space. Their shadows would be cast onto landscapes uh, surrounding them. Now, Kurt Krenn. Um, this is one where the shape of the film uh, is actually um, depicted in what you're looking at, but the content certainly isn't. Uh, we've mostly been looking at work of a highly abstract um, nature, and this is a diagram of a highly abstract nature. It forms, the, it shows the, um, uh, the pattern and structure of the shots. Uh, and what we're going to do now is show a very short clip from the resulting uh, film, um, which is Mama und Papa. Uh, and was it Hermann Nietzsche or was it Otto Moore? It's Nietzsche. It's Nietzsche. It's part of the material action events uh, dating from the 50s through to the 60s and 70s in Germany and Austria. Let's have a clip from the, uh, from, from the film. Okay, thanks very much.
uh, suitably transgressive images that, of course, you couldn't imagine from the rather abstract and uh, pure diagram. Um, Crenn is also <laughs> known for um, uh, extremely purist works where the diagram does indicate the nature of what you're about to see, but it's interesting to see it applied in a rather different uh, documentary direction in which, of course, you can see the splice marks between these shots as well, shot on 8mm film. Now, this is... Um, whispering in my ear. <laughs> uh, yes, we've got Arnold. Yeah, this is uh, Arnold Reiner. I'm just checking because we've had to, we can't actually show the, the film on which this, this is based. This is a film by um, uh, Peter Kobelka, uh, uh, Austrian filmmaker, uh, and it's, the, uh, it's one of many pages for a film purely composed of black and white frames called Arnold Reiner and named in honor of his friend, the painter, who also works in black and white, but um, uh, in this case, this is a wholly abstract film, um, which suffers very badly from video projection, so we'll have to wait for, uh, uh, for another day in 35 mil, we hope. Um, it's composed purely of black and white sequences of frames generated by the mathematical system that you see outlined in front of you. But what we're going to show um, is, uh, is a film that, uh, for which we don't have a diagram, but you can easily imagine its diagram source. It's one minute long and called Adibar, with sound. seconds of Peter Kabelka's Adebar, commissioned actually by um, a cafe, the Adebar, uh, in Vienna, but he turned it into a rather different project. Um, I left out the date deliberately. It was 1957, if you didn't quite catch it at the, at the end, so this is uh, streaks ahead of developments that, uh, that later copy and emulate it. Uh, it only contains four shots, and they're permutated according to the uh, pre-structured system Kabelka uses until they're all exhausted, and then the film ends. Uh, there's always an alternation of positive and negative, and there's always a shot of a young man dancing on his own who hasn't got a partner, which Kubelka sees as the autobiographical element in that rather <laughs> Spartan film. Um, it's, uh, uh, the music is uh, by a, 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 a pygmy tribe and looped and repeated like the structure of the film itself. And finally, you'll be pleased to know perhaps that uh, he wasn't satisfied with 24 frames uh, a second as the basic unit. It seemed rather harsh and mechanical, um, and he preferred a module based on 26 units, so uh, 26 frames. So uh, the cutting is not the usual 24 uh, frames per second, you know, one second equals 24 separate images, but 26 with a double module of 52, which he felt gave a more classical proportion. And uh, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there we are, a, to a, a topic for later. Uh, our next slide is, uh, yes, David, come and talk about this. No, 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 no. Uh, this is Paul Sharrett's um, Color Sound Frames. I, I'm not entirely sure that that's the right title. Uh, this is ac an actual film squashed between two layers of plastic um, so that it actually becomes a, a work of art. But it does have its um, film projected dimension as well. Uh, it, I suppose this is the kind of, this is the, this is probably as close as you get to um, the actual film and the chart being the same thing. 
this could be the chart for making a kind of reproduction of the same film. Uh, I think we have next. Yes, this this is his slightly more mundane um, charted version of. I'm not sure whether it's the same film. I couldn't identify what film this is, but uh, you can see it's very like Peter Cabelka's. It's it's a, a very much a working diagram um, with frame counts and color indications written into it. Again, we're not able to show you th any of these actual films, or either of these actual films. So we're going to show you another film um, from the mid-60s called Peace Mandalam and War, a little clip from it, which again works to very much the same kind of metrical system, and uh, but has the intriguing inclusion of some still photographic images which seem to be animated by the film process as they go through. You'll see what I mean. Can we have the next little piece of film? Okay, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> I know we could leave it on for a long time. Um, it's, it, it's all in your mind, folks. It's all in your optic nerve. Uh, there is no movement in the film itself. If you, if you look at the film strip, uh, the figures do not move. The movement is generated by the collision of uh, separate uh, photographic shots of our, our two people in there. Um, uh, and the rest is down to um, the uh, illusion of movement. Now, um, our next slide. And I do we, have, do we have two of these? Yep. I think we do, don't we? Um, these are diagrams by uh, Liz Rhodes, um, who some of you may know, of course she's taught for a long time at the, uh, the, the Slade School of Art. Um, and uh, we're looking at um, diagrams and notations for a purely abstract film called Light Music, a two-screen film in which the abstract shapes actually also generate the sound. And <coughs> Uh, notes, too, for a film called Light Reading, uh, 1979, uh, which is a figurative film, and um, you'll see it's full of instructions, uh, open shutter, zoom down, um, so many units, open shutter again, zoom down. Uh, that's how the film is constructed, by a process of working directly, um, uh, as it were, with the print. And if we see a brief extract from it now, with sound, Footsteps running away, countering the inward movement of the zoom. Tracking herself through the frame, forced by the sound of the footsteps to feel the constriction of the frame. Tracking herself through the frame, captured, contained, she lost track. Include optical print of the first section, pace the soundtrack exactly, pace out a rectangle 30 by 40 feet, always moving in the same direction, held in line, underline, always under. Misframed in a blank frame, invisible in mid frame. Head of reel one, 105 feet, title. Overexposed, exposed as, imposed on, impaled by. There'd be no decisions, no choice. It had been decided. She had no choice. Thank you, lovely, Tar. Cut. Cheers. Cut, uh, thank you, thank you Liz. Um, and there again you see the, the, the notation structure of the film also finds its way into um, its surface qualities. We, we hear and see some of the operations that have uh, been endemic to its own construction. Um, Schenectady, uh, again a film from the uh, uh, 70s by uh, Heinz uh, Emigholz, a uh, German filmmaker. Uh, it's, it's such an extraordinary image, image. it's not easy to interpret, um, but we actually think that each segment within the large circle represents a frame. And uh, your memory of the film is probably a bit clearer than mine. <laughs> it's, 
it's certainly it's a landscape film where the camera tracks round and round and I think what's happening in this big circle is that he's plotting you can see little red dots in rows he's plotting the number of frames that will be photographed as the camera pans round and the fi in the film the film goes back and forward through the landscape zooming in and out and so on and I think that's what's going on in all these charts um, <coughs> beyond that I can't tell and we don't, sadly don't have a clip of the film to look at Um, a computer-generated diagram from the late 80s by a uh, contemporary of Emig Holtz, uh, Klaus Viborny, uh, also a landscape artist, who attached uh, computer-generated controls to his 8mm camera and uh, used landscape footage uh, in which the number of shots was determined by the, com uh, by, by the computer, which in turn um, can be printed out as a set of, of purely blank instructions, which, as it were, the film fills in, depending on which part of the landscape the camera uh, is aimed at. Oh. <laughs> this is Yantra, which yes. is uh, continuing the computer theme and moving towards the end of our presentation. This is going back to 1957. This is James Whitney uh, working out using a very early analog computer, working out the movements of a turntable on which his artwork was spun by the computer. The computer simply m controlled the movements of the turntable on which his artwork was based. And his artwork was very often simply a single dot or something like that, which he would spin round, or at least the computer would control the spinning round of it. And he would re-photograph it again and again and again, collecting a multiple superimposition of this little image, uh, which you would then colorize, which you would then uh, solarize quite often, you reprint in, in many layers, many colors, building up an incredibly complicated picture from this very simple unit. And what you're looking at there is a diagram showing, I suppose, the repetition of movement by the computer to gain all these images. You can see near the bottom a little kind of diagram of one of the images which you will see the equivalent of on a rather remote generation um, video projection that we're just going to show you. Uh, so yes, the next little piece of video. So this is James Whitney, 1957. <laughs> I'm sure it's really nice to stop there, but I think you've got the idea. That's it, thanks. Okay, um, so uh, our, our final uh, example, Oscar Fischinger, with whom we conclude, going backwards in time to 19... This is uh, early 30s, maybe 31 or 32. This is, this is a drawing of, a, this is picking up on the next presentation on the musical theme, this is a drawing of a, a sound. Um, actually, oscilloscopes would, 20 years later, do the same job extraordinarily well, but they didn't exist back then. And uh, Fishinger was extraordinarily interested in sound. This is the beginning of sound films still, 1928s conventionally the, the birth of sound in cinema. Um, but Fischinger did an extraordinary set of experiments uh, in 1932 where he drew sounds. These are what he called sound ornaments and he just tried out what different sounds would look like if he drew them and put them where the optical soundtrack on the film is. One has to think about um, film technology, sound is represented as a kind of moving squiggly line on the edge of the film strip in old technology. And 
a lot of filmmakers recognized that you could do something with that uh, squiggly line. You could actually synthesize it, you could draw it. Uh, apocryphally, um, people in Hollywood used to actually bleep words that had been missaid in key takes and uh, would draw in a, a replacement word. I don't know whether that's really true or not. But certainly Fishinger tried this out. And miraculously, we do have a little piece of film where he turned these things into into sounds. And you can see what these images look like as sound. So he was actually dreaming a, a kind of possible way of notating sound through pictures exclusively. So let's have the last little clip. I think that's probably enough, I'm sorry. We'll never hit the bottom note, so. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the attending to that. Um, historic examples that I hope connect to contemporary work and ideas as well. And uh, thank you for your time.